Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I am indeed Josh, and the talk is What in the World is Async I.O.? Uh, so before I get started into the talk properly, though, you're probably wondering, who is this guy and why should I listen to him? So uh, I first learned to program using GW Basic on an XT. Uh, yeah, we have one cheer down the front here. I think that's um, about um, yeah, characteristic of that statement. So uh, then I graduated through the various dialects of BASIC, learned a bit of Pascal and some C and then some Delphi and some C++, and then I came across this language called Python. Um, and I found Python intriguing and a little bit scary at first. Probably a lot of you have had similar experiences when you first met Python. It went something like, um, hold on a minute, are you saying that my if statement, um, I don't have to close it with some sort of end keyword or curly brace, but that feels wrong. What what if my code escapes or something? And um, you mean I can insert objects between two different elements of this array thing without implementing a linked list from scratch? Oh, and there's something fishy going on with my string manipulation. It fits on one line, and what it looks like it will do is what it does. Um, I don't know, man, I don't know. Uh, I'd feel like I was cheating if I used Python. So um, I've been using Python for more than 10 years now. Uh, and as was mentioned in the introduction, I work for Netbox Blue, where I spend 99% of my time working with Python. Uh, Netbox Blue has been using Python, Python for a very long time. Uh, Net, the first Netbox Blue code that was written in Python was written for Python 1.3, back when Python 1.3 was the latest stable version of Python. Uh, so we have about 300,000 lines of Python code. Um, and it's good to work in a job where I can work mostly in Python. In my spare time, I also do some uh, work on some open source projects. So for example, this is a screenshot from a game called Trosnoth, which is written in Python using Twisted and Pygame. Uh, I've also written, oh, there was some applause here. This is the release manager of Twisted applauding me. <laughs> applauding me. Um, I also uh, have written a window manager for X11 using Python and Twisted. Um, so just uh, little projects like that. So the talk today is, oh, sorry, before I get to the talk, uh, understanding my audience. So a uh, quick poll, have you A, contributed to PEP3156 and or Tulip, uh, B, you've used async.io extensively, C, you've used Twisted Tornado or some other async framework like that fairly extensively, D, you've played with async programming, or E, you're here because async, async sounds kind of cool. So hands up for A, you've contributed to the PEP or the Excellent, excellent. Good, no one, no one put their hands up. Uh, B, you've used async.io extensively. A few people, okay. I probably don't have a lot of new stuff for you, um, but maybe you can help me answer questions at the end. Uh, C, have you, who's used Twisted or Tornado or some other async framework a fair bit? Um, out of interest, how many of those is Twisted? Because that's what I'm most familiar with. Okay, and um, any, any other frameworks that people have used extensively for async stuff? Not really. Okay, cool. So that means that, sorry, was there? No, okay, that means that when I compare things with Twisted, um, the people who've done async before will actually know what I'm talking about. Uh, D, I've used some async, played with it a bit. Okay, a good number of you. Uh, and E, you thought it sounded kind of cool. Okay, the rest of you. Good, good. I know who I'm aiming at now. Um, so my plan for this talk is to uh, look at what is async.io, and that will include a bit of what's async programming at all, as well as some history of async.io and async programming in Python. Uh, then how do we use async.io? Uh, so I'll give you some examples of the sorts of functions you'd use and some code examples. Uh, is it compatible with other async libraries? Uh, and then if I have time at the end, maybe a few, a few tips for using it. So the first question is, what is async.io? Um, so async.io is a new module in the standard library in Python 3.4. So the obvious place to go to ask what it is and what it does is the Python 3 library docs. And this is what the Python 3 library docs say about async.io. This module provides infrastructure for writing single-threaded concurrent code using coroutines, multiplexing IO access over sockets and other resources, running network clients and servers, and other related primitives. Now this is a very good description of what it does. But I imagine for a lot of you guys out there, this isn't all that helpful. Um, so I've got a simplified definition of async.io for you here. Uh, async.io <laughs> provides you with an asynchronous main loop as well as some IO uh, 
interfaces and primitives for use on that main loop. But the obvious question here is, what is an async main loop? What do we mean by asynchronous programming here? The basic problem that asynchronous programming is trying to address uh, is the problem of concurrency or, or multitasking, if you like. So, um, for example, say I wanted to write another web framework in Python. Um, I might want it to appear as though my web framework is doing multiple things at once. So I might want to be able to uh, start to process Bob's web request before I've completely finished responding to Alice's. Uh, even, especially that, that would especially be the case if Alice is asking something that's going to take me a long time to process. Or I'm going to have to wait on other resources, I'm going to have to fetch something from the internet before I can respond to Alice, that sort of thing. Uh, so the sorts of um, approaches that people have to solving this concurrency problem, um, there are a number of them. So multiple processes. If you use multiple processes, you have the guarantee that each of these processes is separate. You don't have to worry about any sort of global interpreter lock if you're using CPython. Don't have to worry about any sort of shared memory issues. Um, what you do have to worry about is if your processes have to communicate with each other, you'll need to serialize whatever you're communicating down to bytes to send it across between them over named pipes or Unix sockets or whatever you choose as your preferred inter-process communication. Um, if you choose to go with threading, you get around this issue of having to serialize things down. The advantage of threading is that you have some shared memory. The disadvantage of threading is that you have some shared memory. <laughs> so the shared memory is good in that it will allow you to pass complex objects between different threads. Um, it's bad because if two different threads have access to the same object, and you've got some thread scheduler deciding which thread's going to run when, um, you have to think very carefully about how you write your code such that you don't make mistakes where two things try and write to the same thing at once and expect something to happen. So threading has a, a bit of a problem in terms of cognitive load on someone reading threaded code. The third one I have here is called green threads. So in Python, we're talking about things like G event or uh, greenlets. And basically, the rough summary of this is that it's threads, but instead of being managed by your operating system, it's managed by your th third party library. So you're still doing switching um, between, between these greenlets, between these green threads. Um, at arbitrary times, you still have to worry about locking and that sort of thing. Um, one of the possible advantages of this over native operating system threads is that uh, your threading, your greenlets library may be able to optimize for your language when it's going to swap tasks or that sort of thing. Uh, the disadvantage is that you don't get all of the optimizations that the operating system already has to do threads. So I'm going to sort of lump those two green threads and threads in together for the purposes of this talk. Um, and the final one here is asynchronous programming. And that's what we're mostly talking about uh, in this presentation. And basically what this is, is we're going to do this uh, multitasking thing by having an event loop in a single thread in a single process. Now this might seem like a step backwards from using threads for concurrency. Why would you use a single thread in a single process? Um, so let me demonstrate what I meant about threading introducing cognitive load. Now I apologize, it may be hard for those of you at the back to read this. Um, what I have here is an example. So this is an example of code that you might write for single, single threading. So we have, um, this is completely contrived. I made it up just for the slides. What we're doing is we're doing some loop over a bunch of URLs, and we're concurrently getting, getting this URL from the internet. I've deliberately put something in the URL parameters so that we have to do these in order. Um, so we have to do this loop over these things. What we want to do is we want to be able to run this code at the same time as something else is happening. Now, if we're going to do this using threading, what we have to think about is that at every line of code here, what would happen if the scheduler said, OK, your thread, stop. Your thread, you get to start. What happens if another thread, um, if the process gets interrupted during this and another thread gets to run? That could happen between statements here, could happen inside function calls here. So those of you who have done a fair bit with threading, you'll know that uh, there's one glaring error here, and that is that, um, I see if, oh, you can't even see that on there. Okay, is that I check whether self.urls is empty, and then on the following line, I pop something from it if it's not empty. 
um, it might become empty between there. So if we're modifying this for threads, we, at, ver at the very least, we have to make it a while true loop with a try accept around, uh, around our pop. Do it this way. This will work as long as we know that the pop of whatever self.urls is, is itself thread safe. Uh, also, you might have something down here where you have to introduce a lock because you have multiple threads dealing with the same resource. So this is the sort of thing you have to think about uh, when you are dealing with threading. So async, you don't have to worry about this sort of thing because um, whereas with threading, you have some thread scheduler in the operating system or, or in your language that's saying, OK, this thread stops, this thread goes. With asynchronous programming, Basically, once the event loop has started a task, the task can do whatever it likes until it says to the event loop, OK, I'm done now. Or it says, all right, I'm going to go to sleep and I want you to wake me next time we have data on this particular socket, or something like that. So you have this explicit scheduling. So this is called cooperative multitasking, where your task gets to decide um, when it's going to hand control back to the main loop. So the caveat with this is that because this is cooperative multitasking, you do have to be cooperative. Um, you have to write functions that are not going to say, oh, excellent, the main loop has given me control. I will uh, calculate pi to 50 decimal places and then return control. Um, if you have long running things, the rest of your program is never going to get to run. So that's the caveat on that, so the, the trade-off, I guess. Uh, so. Uh, on to what async IO is, so a bit of history of async in Python. So in 1999, Python 1.5.2 shipped with these modules called async core and async chat, or async hat if you pronounce the single C. Um, <laughs> the thing with these modules is that they're very rigid, uh, very few people use them, it's hard to extend. 2002, Twisted 1.0 was released, Twisted gives you an async framework. Um, and that was basically the main async framework to use for a number of years. Come 2009 to 2000, oh, sorry, I missed this one, 2006. Now, this may not seem async related, but when Python 2.5 was released, it had this interesting thing where generators, that's functions that can yield, um, you can push values, send values back into the generators. Um, that has some interesting uh, repercussions for async in terms of being able to write coroutines that you can read nicely. So I'll show you an example of that later, but you couldn't do that until Python 2.5 was, was released. Um, then 2009 to 2011, uh, you had frameworks like Tornado, as well as a lot of web frameworks that gained popularity that did some async stuff. Uh, and there was a revived interest in this idea of async programming. So the problem was that there was no one obvious way of doing it. Um, because you could do it the Twisted way, or the Tornado way, or any one of these other frameworks, um, but they were different. So uh, the Python community recognized this was a problem, came together uh, and put together this PEP called PEP 3153, which was a very abstract PEP, uh, sort of saying what we'd like async stuff to do and providing some sort of idea about how um, network stuff should look on async, didn't really achieve much concrete. Um, but what it did achieve was it got people talking about this. And so a year and a half later, at the end of 2012, we had PEP 3156. And this is what async IO module is based on, originally codenamed Tulip. And um, this provides a whole bunch of clear ideas about what the async uh, interfaces for Python should be, as well as a reference implementation for it. And that reference impl implementation is async IO, which we have in the Python 3.4 standard library, as well as being able to pip install it in Python 3.3. Uh, you can't use it as is earlier than that because the language syntax doesn't support some of the stuff that asyncio does. So um, that's the history of it. How do you use it? So the first thing that you need to know is that asyncio, uh, the implementation is an event loop. So you need to get the event loop. You need to know how to start it. So there's this function called uh, run forever. Basically says start this loop this event loop, run it until someone calls, stop. You also have this one here called run until complete. Um, so async IO has a thing called a future, which represents something that hasn't finished yet. I'll explain those in a sec. A run until complete, you pass in a future, and it will run the main loop until this future is done, and then return control to you. So how, how this would look if you were start, uh, writing an async IO program, uh, you'd 
in your main function, you'd start a bunch of async things, start some things listening, get the event loop and tell it to run forever. There's your simple async I.O. program. Scheduling things. So when you're writing an async program, you cannot say time.sleep, because time.sleep says, ah, I have control of the uh, flow of execution. I'm going to go to sleep and not return control to the event loop. Uh, this is not uh, very cooperative. So here are some functions that you can use in async I.O. Your, you call on your event loop, call soon, and that means, OK, uh, event loop, next time you have the opportunity, please call this function. Uh, and that gives you the guarantee that the order that you call the call soons will be the order that the main loop calls the functions, uh, which is useful in some situations. You have call later, where you give it how many seconds time you want it to call this callback. Uh, and then you have call at, which is saying, call it at this particular time. And of course, this event loop dot time function, because you can, even though async IO provides a reference implementation for the main loop, you could write other implementations. They're not guaranteed to all use time.time. .time. They might use time.monatomic. That might be a good idea. Uh, if you call event loop dot time, that's going to give you what the event loop says is the time now. Um, so, OK, so we can do scheduling. Uh, we can start the event loop. Um, how do we do things that are going to take a while? Uh, so async IO has this idea of something called a future. And a future basically is an object representing something that may not have finished yet, but someday it will either finish or it'll fail. So if you call a function that returns a future, these are the things that you can do with it. You can add a done callback that says, once this is complete or fails, call this function. That function in the callback can then uh, call dot result to get what the result of that call was or dot exception to say what went wrong. The interesting thing about the dot result function here is that if the function that returned the future, if there was a failure, so there's an exception in this future, when you call dot result, it will re-raise that exception for you. So you have to be aware of that. When you call dot result, that's the point that exceptions could be bubbling up from this future. So what this could look like, supposing I wanted to write a function that was, uh, so I'm going to assume that I already have a function available that will do a web request, give me a future, and when that web request is done, it will call back the future with the result. And I want to write a function that is going to do that web request and then decode the result as JSON, for example, and return that back. Um, that would look something like this. So we have at the top here, um, we're going to create a future for our function because we have to return a future. Oh, I should mention, this is not actually the best way of doing it using async IO. This is demoing futures. I'll show you a better way of doing it using async IO in a sec. But using futures, this is how you would do it. Uh, at the top here, we create a future that we're going to return um, to the users because we're a function that takes time. Um, then I'm going to call this get page function that returns me a future and add a callback to it saying, once you're done, do this. Now, in this page data received function here, you'll see that uh, I get the result of the page future in a try except because if that raised an exception, I want to call set exception on my result future to let it propagate back to my caller. Otherwise, I decode the data as JSON and return it, and I return my future. So this is a little bit complicated, but you can see that this is sort of how futures work. You set a callback, it gets called, you get the result from it. The thing is that I was complaining before about how with threading you have to think really hard when you're reading the code um, in order to be sure you know what it's going to do. Now, you don't have to reason really hard to be sure you know what this is going to do, but it is kind of hard to read. Like, you look at this code and you think, why is it doing that? Um, especially since this is trying to do something simple. Basically, this is trying to say, get a web page, decode it as JSON, return it. Um, so this is where coroutines come in. If you're writing something that is essentially a linear sequence of steps, but you want to be nice and return control to the reactor, you can use something in async IO called coroutines. And so this is what this code would look like using coroutines. A little bit simpler, you might say. Data equals yield from get page, return json.loadS of data. So basically what you need to know here is that the words yield from here, now this is a syntax feature of Python from 3.3. Um, it's used for generators to be able to call other generators. Um, what it's used, overloaded to mean in async IO is wait for this. Return control to the main loop and tell it to wake me when this is done. 
So you can yield from a future. Um, that means return control to the event loop. And then you decorate your coroutines with the async.coroutine decorator. So the code that we had before that was doing lots of uh, a loop over URLs doing gets of that, this is what it looks like in a single thread without async. What it would look like with async is uh, you decorate it with coroutine and you change your URL open to uh, whatever this function is that returns a future and yield from. And that's all you have to do. So essentially what you have is if you're comparing it with threading, it's like you have a lock all the time. You're never going to have to worry about another thread interpreting until you explicitly say yield from. So you can easily reason about this code because you know exactly where the scheduler can schedule another task. Um, so very briefly, I want to finish to have time for questions. So compatibility in theory, uh, this is compatible with other um, async frameworks because it defines a clear set of interfaces. So it's possible to write an async IO, uh, it's possible to write an event loop that fulfills async IO's interfaces, but does everything in the back end using twisted. And doing that would allow you to use third party code that's written purely for async IO, um, but run it on an event loop that's running twisted using all of your other twisted code that you've already got. So this is kind of cool. In practice though, most of the adapters you need to do this are not actually written yet. Um, but it's a good step. Uh, and then, of course, the, um, also the interface definition in the PEP for networking uh, is very heavily based on the way Twisted does networking, so it's possible to write network protocols for different frameworks and basically write compatibility adapters between them as well. Uh, some gotchas. As I mentioned before, you have to be cooperative. You don't call time.sleep, you don't call URL open, you don't call anything that's going to take time, uh, any significant amount of time, because that will stop the rest of your async program from doing anything. If you have to use a third party library that's going to do this, that's not been written with async in mind, so it's going to do blocking calls, um, what you can do is you can actually put those in a thread. There's a function in async IO that will run this in a thread and return you a future that will be called when it's done. So it looks to the rest of your program like this is async, but actually it's running in a thread. Um, so that's a workaround if you have to do this. Um, so uh, my conclusion here, async IO is good. Use coroutines wherever possible because when you're using the coroutines, you don't have to worry about the horrible uh, callback-based stuff. I say horrible because the bigger your program gets, the more difficult it is to read the callback stuff. Um, don't block the event loop. That is bad. And remember that when you're writing code, readable code is maintainable code. So always keep that in mind when you're programming. So that's me. Uh, and we do have time for questions. Um, in terms of compatibility, is it compatible right now with libmainloop? Um, I haven't actually used that. Um, is that. Is it asynchronous in the same sense as? It's basically the same thing. It's what's used by GNOME and KDE. Right. Um, in that case, yes, it would be compatible. But again, similar to what I said with Twisted, I don't think anyone's actually written the adapters there. Um, so what it's not compatible with is things like gevent. Um, because gevent is doing the green thread stuff, and that is very different. But if it's something like KDE's main loop, um, then it's compatible in the sense that you could write a, an event loop that fulfills async IO's interface that runs using the KDE main loop or lib main loop. Um, and then extension that is futures in interface as well, because for instance, on top of lib main loop, glib provides a data structure that's effectively identical. Um, yes. The API looks almost the same. Yep. So could you make your futures implementation actually use this under the hood so that you can yes. cross so, languages. Yeah, so can, uh, along with writing your main loop for, or writing your implementation of an async IO compatible main loop that uses um, lib event, you, would, you could write wrappers that basically make your, uh, your version of futures fulfill async IO's future interface so that any libraries that are using it can use it the same way. Cool, yeah. thank you. Hi, Josh. Hi. Um, just wondering, um, 
the Python overloads yield from to achieve the asynchronous results. Yes. Do, do you know offhand why they didn't introduce a new keyword? Um, it, it seems to be a little bit oblique. Um, OK. I wasn't following the entire discussion, um, but Guido was very adamant that async IO, that, or Tulip as it was known then, had to run on Python 3. And Python 3 was already released. Right. So he said, uh, we, sure, we want this in, in the standard library in the future, but we need to be able to run this now. Um, so I think that was part of it. I don't quite know his reasoning there. Um, but essentially, like, when you think about it, though, yielding, like writing coroutines, is all about giving control back to the caller. So it's the same sort of concept. Um, the reasoning for using yield from rather than yield is because um, yield from means that you, from a coroutine, you can yield from another coroutine, and your stack trace will look perfect because the language does... It's just another level in the stack. You yeah. don't have to do some sort of wrapper around it. Yeah. Hey, uh, I, the only question that I had is I haven't been following this because I used Twisted already and yeah. it kind of makes it redundant. But what's the community kind of murmurings about on library support and all that sort of side of things? Um, OK. Uh, so when you say library support... Um, I mean, in Twisted, it's like, OK, I need to go and get Trek or I need to get this tool or that tool, it's not something that anyone else uses. It's a library written specifically for Twisted. It'd be nice to unify the community of libraries into something yeah. that is supported by the standard library. Yes. So there was a lot of input, especially from Twisted and also from Tornado and from a bunch of other, uh, from key developers from a bunch of other ones into the development of this. So there is community support for async.io as a concept. Um, async.io is not going to replace all of Twisted ever. Um, because async.io is focusing on the event loop, like the asynchronous side of things, and the, um, I guess, the interface for network stuff so that people can do it the same. Um, whereas Twisted has a whole lot more in there as well. Um, but the hope from the people developing this is that people will start to work on libraries that do use the async.io interfaces. And people with frameworks like Twisted and Tornado will start working towards making their interfaces compatible with it. Um, so that rather than having to go and fetch a library that's purely for Twisted, you could fetch a library that's written just for pure async I.O., but runs on Twisted because you've got the compatibility layer, or whatever it might be. Yeah, it'd be nice for, you know, Trollop enable Django or Flask or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Uh, so for various reasons... Um, so this will have to be the last question. Yeah, sure. I've just mentioned that. So yep. for various reasons... In in a, in a program, I have to start an HTTP server and an SMTP server, and I found them in a standard library. HTTP server uses threading. SMTP server uses async core. <laughs> Are there any plans to make this sane and somehow use it, like, use a thing I owe so I can start them together? Um, I think plans is probably a bit too um, ambitious a term. Um, maybe dreams. Um, uh, I guess the thing is that, like, I mean, the old adage is that, a, that the standard library is where good libraries go to die. Um, like this, the standard library makes huge efforts at backwards compatibility. So if you, were to, um, if you were to try and make them compatible right now, you would ruin any code that already uses those HTTP um, things. So um, I think there's a hope that people will develop these sorts of things that are compatible. But I wouldn't hope that the existing ones in the standard library are going to be the basis for it, if that makes sense. Yeah. Or you can use Twisted for exactly what you described. <laughs> All right, if we could have a round of applause for Josh. Thanks.